All right, so obviously we're picking up tonight where we left off this morning. I a lot of material. We're, we're continuing the series on Christian cults and, um, you know, Christian in quotes, right? Christian cults. They call themselves Christian, but uh, they're not. And um, the, I just had so much material, and I didn't want to just throw it away or keep you guys here for like an extra hour this morning because uh, we had gone pretty long. And what I did was I, I, I just, I'm really just focusing. There's so many things you can cover that we, it would just take forever to go through every little thing. And, and all of the details aren't even that important because it's the main ones that we're going to focus on. It's the main ones that are keeping them from getting saved. It's the main ones that are, that are keeping people locked in to their false religion, to that cult. And, you know, as I mentioned this morning, the whole point is one, you know, we want to be able to reach these people and then these videos go up online. Hopefully one of them will, will have an honest heart, will want to know the truth, will, will, you know, not just accept what I'm saying, but also not just accept what they've, what they've heard or what they've been taught and be able to analyze and critically think about what they believe, why they believe it, and be able to look back at their history. We went through a lot of the history this morning of their failed prophecies. And I skipped an entire section in my notes. If, if we have time tonight, I'll just go back to that. Um, but there's important doctrines that we're covering now that are, they're just totally false on. Uh, we saw also this morning how their, their own Bible, the New World Translation, is continuing to be revised to be more and more adapted to their doctrines and um, to make it harder for people to challenge them on just their, uh, on their beliefs if they're going to be looking to their, to their source as being the New World Translation. Um, all, however, when they do that, they get farther and farther removed from any so form of legitimacy of having an actual Bible translation. You know, there's a reason why the New World Translation, you know, have you ever been to, um, what's that, the, the website, um, the, the BibleGateway.com? where you have all these different versions online that you can search for. It's a great resource. I love it because when I'm preaching on King James only, you know, I could go and, and copy and paste all these verses and stuff where, where all these modern versions are, are perverted. They don't even have the New World Translation up on that site because it's, it's, it's so bad and it's so faulty that it's just not even worth their time. I assume that's the reason why. I don't know that for a fact, but it's not... I, I do know that among, you know, biblical scholars or people who would consider themselves scholarly and, and um, have some kind of integrity to maintaining pureness, purity within, within the scripture and, and uh, using the manuscripts, that, that the New World Translation is a joke because it literally is created just to fit their doctrine. They have a preconceived idea of what the Bible should say and they make it fit that regardless of manuscript evidence. It doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's, it's just a facade to, to even say that it's a Bible version because it's not. It's just it's their own writings, essentially. Um, anyhow, all of that being said, I'm, we're going to continue on. Now, we started off tonight reading 2 John. And the reason is, you know, while I do want to emphasize the, the purpose and the point to reach these people, we don't hate Jehovah's Witnesses. We want them to get saved. They're, they've been deceived, and we're trying to reach them with the truth. I also want to just make sure, because this wasn't in my notes, I want to make sure I make this point clear, especially with Jehovah's Witnesses, because this is going to be the, the people who you're most likely to have come to your door. See, we go out and, and, not, and go door to door, and we'll be preaching the gospel. And the whole point of that is for us to teach people how to get saved, to show them from Scripture that all they need to do is call the name of the Lord. They need to put their faith in Jesus Christ and get saved. Right? Real simple message. It's the truth. That's what we go out and do. That's why we do it. Now, they want to come in, though, and establish Bible studies. And what some people might ignorantly, well-meaning people ignorantly might end up doing is allowing Jehovah's Witnesses to come in and hold a Bible study in your house and you thinking you're going to convert them or whatever. But what we see in 2 John is that we're not to allow that. See, when someone's going to your house, they're going there to teach you. When Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, they're coming there to teach you. Now, when they come to my door, 
I will give an attempt to take over the conversation and to tell them how to be saved. I will do that because I care about them. But I don't spend very much time with that because if they don't want to listen and if they are there to try to, to, to just come and teach me, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send them on their way and I'm going to let them be accursed. In Galatians chapter 1, it's, going to, it's, it's very similar to what we're reading here in 2 John. It says, if any man preach any other gospel and that which you have received, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel, gospel than that you have received, let him be accursed. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are going around and they're preaching a false gospel. And that is what they're doing. And they're preaching a works-based salvation, which is sending people to hell. So we let them be accursed. Now, if they're going to be willing to listen to me and not try to teach me, I will try to give them the gospel. And if they're going to reject it after one and two admonitions, then I, I let them be like a heretic that just let them be a heretic and move on. And if they're going and teaching that doctrine, the other, their false gospel, then I'm going to let them be a curse and I'll curse them out. And I don't mean using like four letter languages, but you just tell them they're cursed. They're going to go to hell and they're sending other people to hell. It's a curse. Um, and in 2 John, what we see here. It says, uh, look in verse number 10, the Bible says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. So if someone's coming to your door and they're not bringing this doctrine, he says, first of all, don't receive them into your house. When Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, they don't have this doctrine. You don't, you don't say, oh, well, hey, come on in, buddy. Come on in. Let's sit down and we'll talk about this. Now, that actually happened with us, not in this, not this type of scenario, but um, something similar because we were out knocking doors and uh, we had a guy invite us into his house. Now, if someone invites us in your house, there's no problem with going in when we're going in to teach them. And the way the conversation went was, was perfectly fine and acceptable, right? It was something we were teaching them. Now, he probably should have not invited us into his house because his beliefs and his doctrines and everything is different than what we believe. From his perspective, if he was going to be obedient to Scripture here, he should not have just invited us in because we're coming bringing a different doctrine than what he believed. But it doesn't matter what he does. Right? Because we're trying to get them saved. Anyways, what matters is what you do when the Jehovah's Witness or Mormon or whoever comes to your house and trying to bring a different doctrine, you don't just invite them in your house. You do not allow them in your house. You can speak to them at the door. Like I said, if you want to try to give them the gospel, if you think they might listen to you and not try to teach you, go ahead. He says, receive them not in your house, but then also don't bid them Godspeed. Godspeed, meaning... You know, basically that God would prosper their way. God bless you. Or I would say even go as far as having a good day. Because good for them is going to be getting converts. And, you know, you don't want to bid them Godspeed. Don't say that. And now look, I've been guilty of this myself. But it's something we need to pay attention to because it's in Scripture. I know I have the habit of just saying, all right, have a good day. Have a good day. Have a good day. Have a good day. You know, because I'm used to that, especially when we go out soul winning where you're not cursing someone, they just don't want to listen to you. Say, okay, thanks, have a good day, you know. And you get into that habit. Be careful not to fall into that habit when the JW comes to your door to just tell them to have a good day because you're bidding them Godspeed. And the Bible says not to do that. So we ought not to do that. And I, and I just wanted to mention that here because well-intentioned people, especially after hearing some of the sermons, you might be like, oh man, I want to get these people saved I've got some new resources. I've got some new information. I'm going to try to get them saved. And you're going to end up con you know, contradicting Scripture by inviting them in your house and tell them to have a good day and everything else. We don't want to do that. We want to go out and get them saved. But when they come to your door preaching a false gospel, you know, let them be accursed. And that, I mean, that's the scriptural way to deal with it. So that being said, I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way. Turn, if you would, to... Um, so if you would to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. So I left off this morning, getting, I was just about to get into the point where Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. 
They don't believe, they believe that Jesus Christ was just a man, that he is the son of God, but that's where it stops, that he is not, he is not part of the Trinity. They don't believe in a Trinity. They believe that there is just Jehovah God as in, in their, in their understanding of Jehovah is the father and that that's all there is. There is no other aspects. There are no other persons of God and um, that Jesus Christ is just a man and they actually believe that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. They believe that Michael the Archangel, which you read about literally four times in the Bible by name, Four references to Michael the Archangel and somehow they come up with this doctrine that Jesus Christ, the Savior, is Michael the Archangel. And that's ridiculous. Now, the reason why I had you turn to Daniel 10 is because in verse 13 there's a reference to Michael the Archangel. So just keep this in mind that they believe that, that Michael was Jesus Christ before he became Jesus Christ. So their belief is that Michael the archangel existed, you know, when God created the angels. Existed as Michael the archangel in heaven. Then when Jesus Christ was going to be born. Now, I don't know at what point they believe that Michael came out of heaven. If it was when Jesus was born or if it was at conception or whatever, right? I don't know at what point they believe that. It doesn't matter. But they believe that Michael then stopped being Michael the archangel in heaven and just ceased to exist when Jesus Christ came into this world. And then he was Jesus Christ. And then, when he died and he resurrected, then he went back into heaven. Now he's Michael the Archangel again. I know it, it's, it's, I know it's laughable, but, they, but people actually believe this. Okay, and that's why, I mean, for a lot of people have never even heard this before because they want to, you know, they're going to claim the name of Jesus Christ just like all the other cults do. They want to be accepted. They want to, they want to fit in enough so that you don't call them a cult. They don't want to be called a cult because cults have negative connotation for, for good reason. Daniel 10, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. This is talking about Daniel. And, uh, or Well, when Daniel had his vision and he prayed, to have it revealed to him, you know, then, then the angel was sent to give him his answer and, and uh, the angel explaining to him, hey, you know, I came to you, but the, the, the prince of Persia withstood me and then Michael came and helped me out and now I'm here. We finally made it. And, um, I, well, I want, the reason why I turn to this verse is because they're claiming that Jesus Christ is Michael, the, the archangel. Well, Michael is just one of the chief princes. One just so is Jesus Christ. Well, he's just one of the chief princes. You know, there's a bunch of chief princes, and Jesus Christ is just one of them. Does does that sound like the position that Jesus Christ has when you just read the Bible, when you just read Scripture cover to cover? Is that the impression that you get that Jesus Christ? Well, he's just one of many chief princes. Just one. Not the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace. Right? Just, well, he's just one of the chief princes. Because that's what the Bible says here about Michael the archangel. It's ridiculous to say that Jesus Christ was just one of the chief princes. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look a little bit about creation and who created things. Colossians 1, and then we're also going to be comparing that with Isaiah 43, if you want to kind of get ahead and get a bookmarker there. Now, as I mentioned this morning, the best way to give the gospel to a Jehovah's Witness is just like any other person, you give them the gospel. Right? And I'll stand by that. You need to give people the gospel. You show them they're a sinner, show them they need a savior. Show them who that Savior is. Show them, you know, regular gospel plan. But as you get to talking with them, there's these different doctrines to be aware of so that you can cover these things and explain it to them and also be able to prove why they're wrong. Because on the off chance that you get to talk to someone who actually sincerely is interested in the truth, because that's who we're looking for, are people who do care about what's true and do care about what the Bible says and, and are willing to accept God's word over what they've been taught. That's who we're looking for. 
then you should be able to show them these references. So you may want to make note to them, I don't know, um, to be able to add this to, to what you can show Jehovah's Witnesses when you reach them at their door and they're willing to have an honest conversation with you and at least hear you out and not just argue with you and waste your time. Colossians chapter 1 is a good place to show them. Uh, look at, we'll start reading in verse number 13. The Bible says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And we started there to get the context of his dear son. Verse 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, referring back to his dear son, Jesus Christ. Verse 15, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, now, some people and I want to turn here because the Jehovah's Witnesses want to use this and say, see, Jesus Christ is a created being. But that's not true. Being the firstborn of every creature. I'm not going to spend any time on that right now, but um, I mean, it just kind of popped into my mind. They, they do like to use this verse because they, uh, they try to make you think that he was a created being. But let's keep going here. Verse number 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are... So by, by him were all things created. By who? Jesus Christ that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Now, the subject hasn't changed here, but if you're wondering, if you want to say, well, maybe this is talking about the Father or God because he says, well, he's the image of the invisible God and you think that might have changed the antecedent of who is the, the, the him or the he that we're talking about. Well, who is the head of the body, the church? Ephesians 5 tells us very specifically and clearly that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Very clearly, unequivocally, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the head of the body, the church, which means that all of these other, he is before all things, by him all things consist, all things were created by him and for him is again referring to Jesus Christ or God as a whole, as the, the triune God. But, um, and then we'll just keep reading here. He says, uh, verse 19, for it, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now, if Jesus was Michael the archangel at the time of creation, when all things were created, right? Because that's their claim. He's, he's Michael the archangel. Would an angel have created all things for himself? No. Now, they see the verses that talk about Jesus being create, you know, creating things. So in the way that they will reconcile that as they say, well, God's the creator and he used Jesus you know, and God specifically created Jesus and then used him to create everything else. Um, that, that's the way they try to reconcile the verses where you can see very clearly that Jesus Christ you know, was involved in creation and everything else because they don't believe in a trinity. So that's the way that they, that they try to get around verses. But the problem is when we come to Colossians 1 and it says that all things were created by him and for him. Because the Bible, turn if you would to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, under, under their understanding, you have a contradiction in Scripture. It's not a contradiction for, for those that believe in a triune God, that believe in a, in a trinity. That there's one God in three persons. This is not a problem. Isaiah 43, but it is for the Jehovah's Witness or anybody who's going to reject the doctrine of the Trinity. Look at verse number 3 of Isaiah 43. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. And for those of you that don't know, I think everyone in this room probably does, when you see the word LORD in all caps there, that's the, the same name of God as Jehovah, right? So it's the, um, the um, yes, thank you. It's the name of God. Right? But, it's, but it's, it's translated as Lord because that's what it means. It's Lord. And, and we're reading an English Bible, but it puts in all caps so you know that, 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 uh, what it's referring to. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. 
Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Verse 5, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thee seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name. Look at this. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. This is the Lord, this is Jehovah, involved in creation, right? Not just talking about creating Jesus because Jesus wasn't created, but whose glory is it created for? The Father's, right? In their view, that's who they're talking about. This is, this is the Father, not, not anyone else. But Colossians 1 says, all things were created by him and for him. Let's keep reading here, verse number 8. Bring forth yet the blind people, bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, It is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now, this is a place, Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 45, take note of this if you haven't been using this in trying to give the gospel to Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, people who are willing to listen to you and hear things explained and, and, and try to show them contradictions in their belief because to me, this is a really powerful. I've used this with people and I've been able to stump them. Unfortunately, when you stump somebody, unless they really are interested in the truth, you know, it, it, it not, isn't necessarily going to do any good. But you have to find the person who's willing to be honest and have integrity on just acknowledging what's true, acknowledging what the Word of God says. And if they can be honest, they can see the problems already. I mean, they love this verse because this is where they're getting their own name from. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. When they got the name Jehovah's Witnesses, they're referring to this. I don't know if it's this verse specifically, but, but it's in this context. It's from Isaiah where it said, you know, you're my witnesses. And that's why they called us. Well, we're witnesses for Jehovah. We're witnesses for the Lord. Well, you're my witnesses, saith the Lord. And what did he say? That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Again, another reason why I like to use this passage is because you can compare Isaiah 43.10 when he says, understand that I am he, and compare that to John chapter 8. Jesus Christ said at least three times in John chapter 8, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's fine. It's not a big deal. In John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus Christ said, I, there, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. If you, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You said you're not saved unless you believe that I am he. Well, the Lord, Jehovah said, understand that I am he. It's the same thing he's referring to. Back when God revealed, revealed himself unto Moses in the burning bush, he said, I am that I am. And that's where the I am he is coming from. You need to believe that I am he. Jesus Christ said, if you don't believe that I am he, you're going to die in your sins. Verse 28 of John 8 says, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And then in verse 58, in John 8, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claimed to be the I am, and that's why they picked up stones and wanted to kill him. Because he was claiming to be God in the flesh. Isaiah 43, very clearly, the Lord saying, I am he. In the New Testament, John chapter 8, Jesus Christ says, I am he. And that's not the only thing in this, in this passage. That's why I love Isaiah 43 so much when I'm trying to witness them because there's so many places you can go with this. So you've got that statement, I am he. And then the next phrase, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And I like to go to this verse and say, okay, well, how many gods are there? They'll always say there's one God because, I mean, that's, it's so clear. And that's what they pride themselves on. There's one God. It's Jehovah. There's one God. And that's what that says. Yeah, so what's your point? Well, let's turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. That's my point. 
And people already shaking their heads know, know where we're going with that because if you've ever seen a New World Translation in John 1.1, 1, 1, see, we're very familiar with John 1. We like to show people the Trinity, explain who Jesus Christ was when we go out soul winning, and John 1.1 1, 1 is an excellent verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very famous passage. Except what happens in their New World perversion is they say in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was a God. They add that article A, one letter. And just to show you how much of a difference one letter can make of a change. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's just an A. <laughs> it just changed the entire meaning of what, of what that passage says. But what I like to do is I say, oh, yeah, so Jesus, was, yeah, he's not God. He was, he's a God. Well, how many gods are there then? Jehovah Witness, how many gods are there? Answer that. And, and, and you know what? what? What they liked it, and here's a tip too. Because you want to get to the heart, you, you want people to be able to, um, to question things. And the most common defense that people will have is to bring up an, just bring up some other topic. Just change what you're talking about. Don't let people do that to you. If you're trying to make a point and, you're in, and they're stuck on that, because they should be. Because there's no way around that. Either, and the word was with God, and the word was God without the A, or the A is there, and now you have another God. You have to deal with that somehow, yet you have God, Jehovah, saying, before me there was no God formed, so it's not like he was around before God, neither shall there be after me. At no time is there another God. Now we see the Bible talks about other gods with a small g, and they're always false gods. They're devils. They're idols. They're things that are not God, that men call God. Their only other option is to say Jesus was one of those, a false god, which I don't think they're that brazen to actually come out and say it. Don't let them change the conversation and here's the thing if they don't want to to even say you know accept that or just try to, to to get you up on something else then you can end the conversation because if they're not willing to just to just allow this to to open them up you know to to at least admit yeah you know what maybe i need to look into that a little bit more i mean at least then you're making some progress you're you're, you're talking to someone who's somewhat receptive that can say yeah you know i do need to check into that that's a problem and those are the people we're looking for. And if they're not going to be at least that open or have some legitimate, you know, I mean, no, no answer is going to be legitimate, but I think the only other thing they're going to, they might try to tell you at that point is they'll say, oh, well, in the Greek, there is no definite article. So it comes from context and, and, and try to get you off on this whole Greek, just, just rabbit trail. And you say, we don't need to go to the Greek because just based on these words, you say it's a proper translation, fine. If it's a proper translation, how many gods are there? Because in their translation, Isaiah 43, guess what it says? There's one God, and there's no God formed before or after. They, they, they don't, you know, it doesn't say it the way the King James says it, but the thought's still there. And that is a direct contradiction in their own scriptures. This is why I love to use Isaiah 43. And then in verse 11, we have another thing. Because then I like to, I like to ask too, you know, often, depending on which way I kind of want to go, depending, you know, based on the conversation, I set them up. Like in here in verse 10, and the set them up is to prove a point, obviously. So in verse 10, when you say there's no God, you know, so how many gods are there? There's one. You get them to admit to that and, and be firm on that, and then you show them John 1 in their own Bible. And now they have to answer for that. The other thing I like to do before I even go here is just say, well, who's the Savior? Who's the Savior of the world? Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. They'll say that. They'll say they believe, oh yeah, Jesus Christ is the Savior. Okay, let's turn to Isaiah 43. Look at verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Well, you got a problem there. Because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. They don't believe that. I believe he is. I believe that Jesus Christ is one, of the, one member of that Godhead there. And when you see the, the Lord... It's the majority of the time, I believe, referring to the Godhead, referring to the whole the Trinity. 
Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ is the Savior. There is no other Savior. It's God. It's Jesus. They have a problem with that. You have to have a problem with that when you, when you separate them to that extent. Well, is Jesus a Savior or is he not? Because it's very clear that the Lord says there is no other Savior. There is no other Savior. So Isaiah 43, very good. If you don't already use this, use this when you have a Jehovah's Witness that's willing to listen. Because there are so many things found here. Isaiah 45 also reiterates a lot of the similar uh, statements that are made in Isaiah 43. Um, turn, if you would, to Revelation 22. There's a, there's a few places in Revelation that you could turn to also to get them to see that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ is a deity, that he's not just a God, he is God. And there's lots of verses you could turn to, but some of them I, I avoid because I like to turn to the ones that you can still prove to them from their perversion. You know, obviously the word of God is truth, no matter what. But they have, there are certain verses that they've already been hit with after decades and decades and, you know, however long of being challenged on these things, that they have what they consider to be an answer that they're acceptable, that they're, that they're fine with. So in my experience in dealing with them, that's why I avoid um, 1 Timothy 3.16. With, all, with all, all controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. So they have, and I forget um, what their actual rendition is now at the moment, but it's completely different. And it just, it, it's, it's not nearly as strong of a verse as, as, um, as it is there in, in the King James Bible. So I just avoid it because there's so many ways to, to show and to prove that. I'll use Hebrews 1.8. I'll go, you know, I'll show them that. But um, Revelation is a good one because it's a little, I think it was a little bit too complicated. You know, Isaiah 43 was like a little bit too complicated for them to figure out that they have a contradiction. So they're not ready for it. And that's what we want to do is throw them off. Because you don't want them just to regurgitate some answer because then they're not going to be thinking at all. The only way you're going to reach through, reach these people is to get them to think. Get them off track a little. Get them to think. Get them to question. If you can't do that, then, then it's meaningless. It's pointless. So that's why I'm bringing up some of these other examples to try to get them on a train of thought to, to really consider this and think about this. Revelation 22, verse number 12. The Bible says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. This is Jesus Christ speaking, and we can prove this. Um, obviously, he's coming again. He's talking, about, he's talking about the return. You know, I'm, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So these are the claims being made. Verse number 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So if there is any question about who's doing the talking here in verses 12 and 13, verse 16, he says, I, Jesus. He's naming himself. And, you know, if they want to say, no, no, in verses 12 and 13, that's Jehovah, and then in verse 16, that's Jesus. I mean, first of all, that's a big stretch anyways, and it's almost laughable, but you can still say no. Look at verse number 20. He which testify these things saith, surely I come quickly, which is the same phrase in verse 12, behold, I come quickly. But then in verse 20, it says, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. So who is coming? Lord Jesus. So when he says, I come quickly in verse 12, it's Jesus. So in verse 13, when he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, Jesus is making that claim of who he is. Flip over to Revelation chapter 1. So you take Revelation 22, you establish this. Who is this? This is Jesus speaking. 
I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 8, where we'll start reading. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Well, we just established in Revelation 22 that this is Jesus Christ. So who is this? It's got to be Jesus Christ again. Revelation 1.8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Who's the Almighty? Well, we know who the Almighty is, but that, that's just one more thing to throw on. But let's keep going here because we're going to prove this point further. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Again, the same phrase, the first and the last, Alpha and Omega, this has to be Jesus Christ. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. So just to put yourself in this story, John is, you know, on the Isle of Patmos, on the Lord's day, he's walking, and he hears this voice behind him, it sounds like a trumpet. And he hears this command, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and last. So he hears this, and then he turns around, to see who's talking to him. And then he sees seven golden candlesticks. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Again, very clear throughout Scripture. You shouldn't get arguments about these types of statements. The Son of Man. Yes, it's Jesus Christ. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now, the reason why I'm turning to this passage again is specifically mostly for that verse 17 and 18 to just um, corroborate what we saw in Revelation 22 that again, this is talking about Jesus who claimed to be the first and the last. Because is Jehovah he that was dead? No, no of course not. Jehovah, uh, you know, again, we're, we're, we're thinking about in the minds of a Jehovah's Witness, right? Jehovah didn't die. Well, Jesus did, though. Jesus is the one who liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. That's Jesus. They cannot deny that. He says, I am the first and the last. But then in Isaiah... Again, this is Isaiah 44. If you want to write down the reference, Isaiah 44, 6. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Oh, wait a minute. Who's the first and the last? It doesn't say a first and a last. The first and the last. Jesus Christ, or in Isaiah 44, the Lord. Beside me, there is no God, which it's in there again, just in case you, you wanted to put the word was a God. No, beside me, there is no God. In Isaiah 48, verse 12, also, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, and again, that reference to I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. The statements being made are unequivocal. You cannot reconcile this without recognizing that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. There is no way around this. And it's so critical, as I was mentioning this morning, you know, if you don't have the right Jesus, you're not saved. You have to have the right Jesus. Jesus Christ is God. He's not just a man as the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses want to say. So in order to get these people saved, we have to get them to recognize that. Now, I'll reiterate, 
We start by trying to give them the gospel. But one of the aspects of the gospel is explaining who Jesus was. Explaining what he did. And you should do that with everybody. It's just easy in America because most people already understand the concept of the Trinity and have not any issues with Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. They've heard that. It's not a problem for them. But for Jehovah's Witnesses, it is. And if it's someone's not a Jehovah's Witness and they have a problem with that, then you need to be spending time on that too. You need to make sure they know who Jesus is. Now, another one of their doctrines, and this isn't, a, um, this isn't an important doctrine necessarily, but it's tied into salvation, and it has to do with, and, and I brought this up this morning, with them believing, you know, if you, the reason why I don't ask them, if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Because I avoid the conversation about heaven and going to heaven with them until I after I can get, if I can get through the whole gospel, I, I, I wait till later on to kind of bring up this point. But if you're having a conversation with them and they're truly listening, but they're still kind of stumped and they're not, you know, they're not coming around, this is a good way also, I believe, to maybe get them to question some things about their belief because it's pretty easy to show. This is one of the reasons why I like this, and it's something that they should know a lot about. If for whatever reason, this is something that they teach a lot and that, that, that generally Jehovah's Witnesses know a lot about. Oh, we don't go to heaven. We spend our time here on earth. There's 144,000 that go to heaven. So turn, if you would, to Revelation 14. Because Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 are the two places that the Bible ever talks about a group of people that are 144,000. That's it. Revelation 7, Revelation 14. And they think that these are the people throughout the entire Bible, the only ones that are going to heaven are in this 144,000. So it's a pretty ridiculous concept and it's easy to prove false. But there are people and the number, so and I don't want to get into all those details on what they do. They, they have some people who claim to be part of this group. And, and it is comical. Because th think, just think about the grand scheme of time. We have, what are we, almost at 7 billion people worldwide now or something like that? I mean, 7 billion. 144,000, first of all, just versus 7 billion. That's just alive right now in 2017. 2,000 years since Christ. How many people have lived and died? Okay, how many Christians have lived and died? How many people that they would claim to be Christians? It's still a lot of people. Even if you're only looking at the ones that they would consider to be Christians. Because they think there's been this long gap. So you say, okay, there's a lot of time where there's just this gap. And no, apparently no one knew anything. So all those people, yeah, it's easy to say, oh yeah, those people in the past, they, they're, none of them are part of the 144,000. As if they know anything about the people who have died in the past 2,000 years, Right? But they just, yeah, because it's going to screw up our numbers if we don't say that none of them are part of it. But they have to acknowledge, what about people in the first century? What about the people that, you know, Jesus' disciples, not just his apostles, but his disciples. I mean, how many of those would have to be in this elite group of 144,000? There's got to be a bunch, even at that time, in that early church that they said they still had the truth back then, Right? 144,000 is not a lot of people at all. Not at all. And they think that to be part of this, and just how many people since uh, Charles Taze Russell days, you know, the late 1800s to now, past 100, you know, 100 and some odd years, 150 years or whatever, are claiming or have, or think, you know, th this goes back to their pride that. I have been such a good Jehovah's Witness that I am one of this 144,000. The way they identify it is they, they, pass, they get this one gathering where they all come together and they pass the, the cup and the bread around like a Lord's Supper and they, no one's allowed to partake of this except for the people who think they're part of the 144,000. So when they all gather together, there's just this plate that just passes around, just passes, 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 and no one's taking anything because they're like, well, 
I'm not one of the 144,000. And then what they do is they watch for someone who does partake. And if it's someone who's been in the witness organization for a long time, right, someone that they know, someone who's, who's been going for a long time, they, they make note of that. They just make note that this person thinks that they're one of the 144,000. If it's someone that they don't know, it's just like some random person just comes in and, and partakes, they just kind of blow that off. They don't take that seriously. And they watch these people because they're, they're, they're marking like how many they think are part of this because the more people there are, the, you know, the more that number has to keep going down of, of how many slots are left in their 144,000. But it's kind of a big deal. You know, all of that say, to say this, it's kind of a big deal for them. You know, they, they, they generally know a lot about this, which is interesting because they don't know a lot of the scripture, but they just know a lot about the teaching. And you're in Revelation 14. Look at verse number 3. This is where we're going to find this in Scripture. The Bible says, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. So now it's going to give the criteria of who the 144,000 are. And I like to show this to them because you say, well, you, you realize, especially if it's like a woman you cannot be one of the 144,000. Can't be you. Or a white person. Can't be you. Because we'll, we'll read through this. It says, verse 4, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. So it has to be talking about men. Not being defiled with a woman. I mean, in today's perverted culture, you say, oh no, it could be a woman because they're not defiled with another woman. No. God doesn't sink that low to, to describe people that are virgins as not, you know, as some queer not doing anything with another, you know, whatever. This is talking about men. They that which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, even these, some of these statements, it's like, how do they even think this? You know, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. They're following Jesus. Wherever he goes, they're following. And not only that, it says they're the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. How can you be the first fruits in 1918, you know, whatever, like you just keep on going and you continue to be the first fruits over like 100 years? That doesn't make much sense either. The first fruits. Verse 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Oh, so you, now you're sinless? You're without fault? This is how you become one of the, you know, they, you know, they want to become a, one of the 144,000. Not realizing that these are people who, they already passed. They've, they've already, this already has happened. They're already, the, this, this group is already sealed in my opinion. I think this is already done. Who the 144,000. Now turn if you would to Revelation chapter 7 because this is where we get other um, criteria than what we saw in Revelation 14. Revelation 7. Revelation 7, in verse number 3, this is, this is when God's preparing to pour out his wrath in both places. When the, when the 144,000 are mentioned, God's getting ready to pour out his wrath. And this is right at the time of the rapture. He's getting ready to pour out his wrath and all this stuff's going on. Verse number 3 of Revelation 7 says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, because he's about to pour out his wrath until, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So we're going to wait. We've got to seal the servants of God. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad. So it goes on and on about the tribes. Well, what you ask them then is, well, what tribe are you of? You think you're one of the 144,000? How many Jews do you know, O Jehovah's Witness? And not only can you be one of the 144,000, you have to be only one of 12,000 of whatever tribe you're from. That really narrows it down. You're, you're, you don't have even such a big group of 144,000. You could only be one of 12,000 because you have to belong to the specific tribe that God's referring to here that is of this 144,000 as 12,000. So when you get to that point, you, you know, hopefully you could get their wheels kind of thinking a little bit like, well, who are this one, you know, who really is the 144,000? Because this is not what they're being taught at all. Yet it's so clear in Scripture. 
Verse number nine, let's uh, jump down there a little bit. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So this is a vision that John saw in heaven. Where's the throne of God? It's in heaven. So uh, you know, another thing to just show to them, well, wait a minute, then if only 144,000 get to go to heaven, who is this multitude that no man could number? It's not at 144,000 because God already gave you that number. A man can number 144,000, otherwise he wouldn't have given us that number. This is a separate multitude that no man can number. Of all nations, not just of the 12 tribes of Israel, and kindreds, and people, and tongues stood before the throne. How many people are going to heaven? You, can't, you cannot get around these verses. They're so clear. This is why I like to use them. So this is something, again, take notice. Verse 10, And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So this is an opportunity to show a Jehovah's Witness that here's this great multitude. This isn't the 144,000. And it explains who they are that... These are people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, which they should be able to acknowledge. These are people who are saved by Jesus Christ that are standing, that came out of great tribulation and now they're here in heaven standing before the throne as explained by the angel. What does this mean? What does this mean? Tell me. And see, one of the tricks that they like to do is especially in you know, the book of Revelation, any cult's going to do this, but... Um, they like to just say, if there's anything they don't know or anything you hit them with out of Revelation, oh, well, that's symbolic. Oh, well, this is all symbolic. Oh, yeah, Revelation, you know, eh, no one really knows what that means anyways. It's symbolic. No, 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 no. Some things are symbolic here, and, and I'm okay with that. But he asks for, he asks for an explanation. The explanation is given to make things clear. You know, when he saw the seven golden candlesticks, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you. You know what? They, yeah, that's symbolic. But then, when he's ex it's explained to him what the seven candlesticks are, it's no longer symbolic. Because we know what it is. We know what it says. God is not deceiving you with the book of Revelation by revealing things to you. Don't let the people, you know, again, this, this still goes back to someone who's willing to have a conversation with you, but don't let them get away with these things of just, oh, well, it's, it's symbolic. No, it's not. No, it's not because he says right here what this is, what this is referring to, who these people are. They're people that are saved, that are in heaven, that are not part of the 144,000. And you explain to them, this is why I'm showing this to you, because it's good news. You've been lied to, but there's more than just 144,000 people going to heaven. It's accurate. It's biblical. What does the scripture say? Verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They believe that the majority of people will just live on this earth, earth and the 144,000 are going to heaven. And like I said, that in and of itself isn't like some, you know, te you know when we're, if we're going to teach someone who the 144,000 are and what they represent, that's not a big deal. That's not a salvation issue. But in a way, they make it a salvation issue just because they're saying those are the only people going to heaven. And it, it's, it's good to show them they're not the only people going to heaven. 
They're actually the people that were in heaven coming down to this earth because you know, they're being sealed, so they're not, they're not being um, affected by the plagues, by God's wrath coming on the earth. I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole point of them being sealed. So, what else do I have on here? We covered that. We, co we covered a lot with the New World Translation in the morning service on how screwed up that was. Be aware, though, that they do have the 2013 revision and they're just continuing to adapt things and, and um, uh, just be ready. You know, the, the bottom line... Be ready for anybody that you give the gospel to. You don't have to study everything about Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and everything else. If you're ready because you know Scripture, then you'll be able to provide an answer to people. You'll be able to show them their error because you know the Bible. You know the Word of God. There's a lot of these places that I'm showing you right now the vet, I mean, almost all of them, if not all of them, I accumulated from my own experience with, with soul winning and talking to people. Because as you're continuing to study and read the Bible, you come across these passages where you're like, oh yeah, you know, this is, this is great. Uh, this, is, this is perfect for this situation or whatever. And you make note of it and you, you, know, you, you, you memorize it or you write it down. You, know, you, you consider these things. And if you're just reading your Bible regularly and you're doing Bible memorization and stuff, when you talk to someone, even if it's just some crazy religion you've never even heard of before, if you're able to have a good conversation with them, you know, the best way you can be prepared is just to know this because something, you know, the Holy Spirit will, will bring Scripture to memory when they come at you with something. Oh, no, that's not true because the Bible says and be able to bring it up. So instead of focusing on learning every false religion, the majority of our time should be spent on learning the right religion, learning the word of God. That will help you to be most effective. Now, I'm not, you know, I, I do these sermons to, to, to let you, to inform you about some of the things that they believe, some things to be aware of, just to kind of help you be on your feet, to learn some good places of scripture that might be helpful in a conversion of a Jehovah's Witness. But at the end of the day, you know, I, stay focused on this. Stay focused on the Bible, and, uh, and, and you'll do well. Let's borrow and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your clear teachings from Scripture. God, I pray that you please help us to have a, a humble attitude when we go out soul winning. Help us to instruct others with meekness. Help us, help us to instruct them, dear Lord, that we wouldn't just allow ourselves to be pushed around when we're trying to teach people and to show them what the, what the Bible says and, and the free gift of salvation, Lord. But help us not to become arrogant or get in these arguments and conversations to where we think that, uh, you know, we're just going to go and school them and show them how stupid they are. That's not the point, Lord. Help us to have the proper spirit that, um, that hopefully that they could receive, um, that they could have repentance on what they believe and that we could show them in a, in a, in a humble way the errors of their ways. Lord, help us to be good students, that, that we would all study to show ourselves approved unto God and that we could be workmen that needeth not to be ashamed and that, you know, definitely one of these cult members wouldn't be able to just uh, to leave us without an answer and, and to um, not be able to defend our own faith, dear Lord. Pray that you please strengthen this church, strengthen our faith, and, and uh, strengthen our soul winning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.